Good morning. I'm Beth Walter, pastor at First United Methodist Church in Camden, Arkansas, and we're here to bring you our morning worship service. I just want to talk to you for a few minutes about how we stay connected because my job as your pastor is to empower um, you, the laity, to connect to one another, to do what I can, but also uh, empower you. And I just want to thank the shepherds because they have been great. I've heard stories this week of how they've helped so many people out, and I'm grateful for them. We're going to be doing more things over the coming weeks, including honoring our seniors. And if you have ideas, we would love uh, for you to share them with us. But one of the other things I want to ask you is, I think sometimes you, get, you should get tired of hearing me. And so I'm encouraging you to send me an email or uh, drop me a note. And how are you experiencing this pandemic? How are you experiencing our church? Has a shepherd done something wonderful for you? And you want to share that because we want to share your stories with each other. And we would like that our weekly email contain some of the pictures and the stories from you. So I hope you'll think about that and submit some things to us so we can uh, share what's going on in your lives with the entire church. Because if you're like me, I miss seeing all of you here. God has been good. And this morning we gather for worship, so let us prepare our hearts to receive the Spirit. despair. Christ is here. When your hope falters, open your ears. God, God is speaking words of comfort and love. When your spirit sags, open your hearts. The spirit is here to God you hum. Come worship with us wherever you are, for with God you are home. Will you join us in singing a, uh, a wonderful hymn called Blessed Assurance?
Let's take a moment of silence as we think about the events of this past week, as we think about the things that we are grateful for, as we think about the things that we're sorry for, as we think about all that God has done. Now will you join me in our prayer of confession. Holy, Holy God, God, we long to recognize your presence, but the journey can be confusing. We yearn to hear your voice. We desire to touch the life-giving water and the power of your enduring word, so we may know your forgiveness and grace each and every day. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. In the name of the risen Christ, we are forgiven and free. In the power of God's enduring word, we are given new birth and offered a community of resurrection and hope. So if you notice today, for our children's sermon, I have my mask on. And uh, the book we're going to look at is Being Kind. And one of the important things that we are doing to be kind to one another is to wear our mask. And uh, we wear those in public. We wear those if we go anywhere. We don't have to wear them in our homes, but it's really important if we're gonna be around other people that we wear our mask. We have a sign uh, through and on our drive-through where people come through uh, either for Sue's table or our food pantry, and it tells them that we wear our mask and we wear our gloves to protect them, our cherished neighbors. It's one of the ways that we show God's love and one of the ways that we're kind to one another. And so here uh, is a book called Be Kind, and it's how two simple words can change the world. And it's a story about a young girl named Tarnisha, who spills grape juice all over her new dress. And uh, she has a classmate that wants to help her feel better, and she doesn't know how to do that. Tanisha spilled grape juice yesterday all over her new dress, and everyone laughed. I almost did. But mom always tells me to be kind, so I tried. I don't think it worked. I told her that purple was my favorite color too. I thought she would smile, but she ran into the hall instead, and when she came back, snack time was over, and she put on her art smock and didn't look anymore at anyone. I almost told her that art was my favorite class, but I didn't want her to leave again, so I painted purple splotches and added some green until I had a bunch of beautiful violets. While I painted, I thought about her. She, uh, should I have handled, handed her my napkin or let her borrow my sweatshirt, spilled my juice so everyone stared at me, it said? What does it mean to be kind anyway? Making cookies for Mr. Rinaldi, who lives alone, or letting someone with small feet have my too tight shoes. Maybe it's helping put dirty dishes in the sink or cleaning up after Otis, our class guinea pig. He's a messy eater. Maybe it's paying attention or telling Desmond I like his blue boots, or making the new girl to be my partner, or listening to Aunt Franny's stories even though I've heard them all before. Being kind should be easy, like throwing away a wrapper or recycling a bottle, or saying thank you or bless you or what's new or good afternoon. Mom says the quickest way to be kind is to use people's names. Maybe I can't solve her grape juice problem. Maybe all I can do is sit by her in class and paint this picture for her because I know that she likes purple too. Maybe I can only do small things, but my small things might join small things other people do. And together, they could grow into something big, something really big, 
so big that our kindness spills out of our schools and spreads throughout the town and travels across the countries and goes all the way around the world, right back to Tunisia and me, so we can be kind again and again and again. And so this week, I hope you find a way to be kind, not only to your parents, but also your brothers or your sisters or, or your neighbors. Thank you. So last week we began a series in 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And we talked about how this is a really appropriate text for the time we live in today. We talked about that Peter wrote these letters to the churches in Asia Minor. These weren't large churches, they were fairly small churches. And the churches were made up of slaves and servants, a lot of the poor of the population, and even women of wealth. But all of these, even the women, were second-class citizens. They were, um, uh, they were low on the power totem pole. We also discussed that when they accepted Christ, they were called to live differently. They were called to be different. And what Peter is assuring them of is when you accept Christ, you have a permanent inheritance in God's promises to you. What you need to remember, though, is that not all people will be happy with your newfound faith in Jesus Christ, but they can't change your circumstance. So now we're going to look, skip a few verses over, and go toward the end of 1 Peter, and we will find a continuation of this letter. So I'm in 1 Peter. And um, still first chapter, but I'm going to start with the 17th verse. Since you call upon a father who judges all people according to their actions without favoritism, you should conduct yourselves with reverence during the time of your dwelling in a strange land. Live in this way, knowing that you are not liberated by perishable things like silver or gold, from an empty lifestyle you inherited from your ancestors. Instead, you were liberated by the precious blood of Christ, like that of a flawless, spotless lamb. Christ was shown, chosen before the creation of the world, but it was only revealed at the end of time. This was done for you, who through Christ are faithful to the God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. So now your faith and hope should rest in God. As you set yourselves apart by your obedience to the truth so that you may have genuine affection for your fellow believers, love each other deeply and earnestly. Do this because you've been given new birth, not from the type of seed that decays, but from seed that doesn't. This seed is God's life-giving and enduring word. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Let us pray. May your scripture always be my delight, O oh Lord. May I not be deceived in them or deceived by them. Amen. So I used to have a different kind of life. And I worked up until my third child was born and having three kids, um, three, years, three years between the oldest and the youngest, it kept me quite busy and I really didn't have time for work. But I found that um, as my children got older and entered into nursery school and then into elementary school, I had more time on my hands and we had purchased uh, a home that had a wonderful uh, playground in the backyard, but it also had a very large garden that had never really um, uh, been developed. So I decided to take home gardening. 
Now, I realize that I'm talking to some master gardeners who have all the knowledge that I don't have. So uh, you're just going to have to bear with me. Um, when I took on gardening, and um, what I first discovered is I didn't know anything about gardening. I mean, I had planted flowers as a kid, and I had planted seeds. But this was a big garden plot, and so I really wanted to do it right. And so the first thing I realized is, you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know how to make it work. I don't know what is best. So I got a book, and I read this book. And this was really before you could go online and look at things. So I had this stack of gardening books that was about this tall. And I read them, and I read them, and I read them, and I would go to um, um, gardening centers, and I'd walk around and look at plants, and I had no idea what I was doing. So the first thing I did is I decided to plant hydrangeas. And this book told me um, that this, this, if you want to plant, then you need to plant on a north wall and you needed to make sure that your ground was right. So what I learned uh, right off the bat was that the soil made a difference. You could choose healthy plants and you could choose the right seed, but if you didn't, um, if you put them in bad soil, they would not thrive. And so I followed the instructions and I dug way down and I put all the stuff in the soil, including the really smelly stuff. And I will tell you right now that I can still drive by that house in Little Rock and those hydrangeas are absolutely gorgeous because I picked the right plant and I did the soil right and in their first few years, I tended them the right way. And that's what you learn. It's not only the soil, and it's not only choosing the plant, it's what kind of plant you choose. So if you go to a gardening center, there's wonderful plants, and they're colorful plants, and they're called annuals. And what you discover about annuals is it's really easy to plant them, but the first frost that comes along, they're dead. And you're going to have to replant them again next year. And after a few years, that can get really tiring, especially if that's your whole garden. But then I learned there was something called perennials. And perennials were, if you took care of them, they were imperishable. So you had the plants, like annuals, that were perishable, and you had um, the perennials, which were imperishable. And then you had to learn how to take care of them. Because even though perennials would die off in the winter, they would start coming back again in the spring. And you had to know your plants to know which ones were the weeds and which ones were the actual perennial that would turn into a beautiful flower. This goes along with our scripture passage for today. I want you to think about it in terms of gardening. First of all, it tells us that we need to approach our obedience with a reverence. And uh, in the uh, New Revised Standard Version, it calls it reverent fear. And the CEB, which I read, it just calls it reverence. Reverence fear and, and reverence are means that we hold something uh, in esteem. In other words, uh, we realize that this, whatever it is, we're showing it respect. We recognize when it comes to God that we should have reverence to God and, and somewhat a fear to God. And all that is saying is that God is God and we're not. There is a distinction. God isn't Superman. He isn't like us and... Uh, just with superpowers, God is something holy and wholly different. And just like when you approach a garden, you have, knowing that you don't know everything about gardening, that same thing is when it comes to approaching God 
you don't know everything about God. And you're not going to know everything about God. There's going to be mysteries about God, and, and you have to hold those in reverence. What Peter is also saying is when it comes to your obedience and it comes to all that is holy, you have to have good foundation. You have to have good soil. And setting your foundation right means you're going to get your hands dirty. Setting your foundation, which is what we do in children's ministry here and what we try to do in uh, confirmation, is making sure you understand that we are here because of Jesus Christ. Our foundation is Jesus Christ. It's not our own goodness. It's not being a good person. It's not all of our good works. Our foundation, the soil that we till and the soil that we sink our roots into is Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Jesus Christ, who is God's only son, who came to earth and took on human flesh and lived among us. And he lived a life of self-revelation of who God is. So if you know Jesus, you know God. And that is our foundation. And that's the roots we sink our church into. It's the roots we sink our faith into. It's the roots we sink our uh, missions into. Everything we do should be rooted in Jesus Christ. And then it comes to choosing your plants. Are you going to choose things that are perishable? Or are you going to choose things that are imperishable? And this life that we live, we all can look at our life and say, you know, I had devoted all this time to something that was gone like that. Or you, you select seed that's going to bear fruit. Bear fruit in your own spiritual growth. And bear fruit in the way that your roots develop and they sink into the soil. And the way your branches go out and the way we learn how to love. And finally... He's talking about how we learn to love each other. And that's, and that's all in how we tend to this, this wonderful garden of a life of faith that we have. Because the ultimate goal of sanctification is not self-righteousness and self-piety. The ultimate goal of sanctification is learning to love God with all of our heart and all of our actions and all of our words and all of our thoughts and learning to love our neighbor as ourselves. And where we learn to love each other is in this community of faith we call the church. Now, sometimes it's really easy to love one another, isn't it? And sometimes it's really hard to love one another because sometimes we have disagreements and that's okay. We keep coming to the table because we both have our roots sunk into Jesus Christ. And we learn how to care for each other. And we learn how to talk to each other. And, and, and even in our disagreements, we learn how to grow and we learn how to develop. And so that's what Peter is trying to tell um, these followers of Christ in Asia Minor who feel like they've been alienated, who feel like they're all alone. He's telling them that you have a rich inheritance that's permanent. But he's also telling them <coughs> that you've got to learn to tend the garden. You learn how to care for one another. You have to learn how to use the tools of the garden. 
And those tools of the garden that we use are our love of scripture, our prayer life, how we learn together, how we grow together. So our challenge this week is even though we're shut up in our homes, and even though all we can do is call one another on the phone or wave at one another in the neighborhood, what we have to learn to do is how do we care for each other in this diaspora that we call a virus? How do we make sure that no part of our garden is uh, decaying or dying? It's really important, and we're learning new skills on how to do that. So we invite you today to join with us as we continue on this journey through Peter, and also as we continue to read Peter and look at our own lives at what we can learn. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope that you will take time to read your prayer list. It's in the bulletin uh, that we supply in the Friday email. And um, I hope you will continue to remember those names. We have added a few more names and continue to remember them. Will you join me in prayer? Loving God, how we desire to really live as your Easter people. We yearn to know you, and we pray that you will enter our lives in such a way that our doubts and our fears, our uncertainties, will be transformed into confidence, trust, and an openness to your grace, to your healing power. Enable us to be like little children, excited and empowered by the new life and new possibilities you have in store for us. And in the midst of our Good Fridays and our isolation, give us purpose and direction. In this season of Easter, let us be aware of new beginnings. We lift up prayers for all who suffer from physical and mental illness, and we give you thanks for the new medical breakthroughs that may not have happened yet, but will happen in the future. We lift up prayers for victims of this virus. Enable us to be supporters of one another and help us to be examples to our young people of how to care for one another, how to value human life, and how to celebrate and embrace diversity. We lift up all who live in poverty and have been affected. We lift up those without shelter or food. May we be shapers and workers in programs that provide food for the hungry, shelter for the homeless, and clothing for the deprived. Enable us to really listen to one another's concerns, hopes, and dreams, and to recognize and change those behaviors that undermine healthy relationship. Finally, we lift up prayers for ourselves. Help us realize that our worth in your sight as we are tempted often to tear ourselves down for our shortcomings and failures. Help us to learn to love, respect, and take care of ourselves and each other modeling the love that you've first shown us. Resurrect our spirits when we're feeling down, lonely, confused, isolated, or depressed. For we are your children, precious and honored in your sight. We are your people. Help us to live out that identity in all we say and do. We pray this in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now I invite you to join us in singing It Is Well With My Soul.
join me in our benediction. As you meet strangers on the road, let mutual love increase. Born of the imperishable seed of God's love, we will grow in grace and power. As you experience Christ in the smile of another, be purified in the presence of our holy God. Born to grow into oaks of righteousness, we go forth to reveal the glory of God in our lives. Go with God's blessing.